Hi there. Um, who do you think is more successful between Joseph and John the Baptist? Because Joseph went from prison to palace and John the Baptist went from prison to the grave via the palace with his head on a silver platter. Um, welcome to today's lesson discussion, which is entitled, um, it's lesson eight, entitled Planning for Success, part of the our series entitled Managing for the Master Till He Comes. My name is Jason Nalaz, and I'm not on my own. I've got a couple of friends who will introduce themselves. Good day, viewers. My name is Tekuz Amlambo, and I'm looking forward that we're all going to learn at the feet of Christ. Hello, viewers. My name is Chie Zalunga. Welcome to today's discussion. Good day. My name is Nomo Samtembo, when we are going to pray first. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that you've given us to come to your feet as we study the lesson on planning for success. We pray that you may lead us, O Lord, in everything that we do. May the Holy Spirit be the one that is guiding for the fulfillment and for the enrichment of our lives and also of our viewers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. So today we're talking about success, which is a very popular word, but sometimes proves elusive. Um, and uh, our memory text comes from Colossians 3, verse 23 and 24. And since I'm in charge, I can cheat by reading it out. <laughs> I don't know it by head. <laughs> and it reads, I'm reading from the New King James Version. And it reads, whatever you do, and whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Okay, that's, that's, that's our memory text for today. But I, I was hoping... Before we get into working heartily for, for God, um, I was hoping you'd help us. Uh, what is success? We all like the word, but let's define our terms here. What is success? Uh, maybe I can start. No, success depends on who you are, mm -hmm. how you define it, really. It's, um, but really, it's an achievement of an aim or a purpose. You start off with a purpose, and then when you've achieved that, then you've been successful. Okay. Um, in our context here, because we want to be heavenly, um, successful, it's uh, more than just achieving things. You know, when, when, you, when you see somebody and you're saying that they're successful, usually they will have lots of money, mm -hmm. their wealth and all that. But in terms of um, heavenly success, you know, it's more than that. Because our, our mandate here that Jesus gave us when he went was, that it was to go here therefore and mm -hmm. preach to all generations, eh? mm -hmm. and teaching them and baptizing. So our mandate really then in that case is when we've gone and we are seeing that people's lives have been changed by the message that we have, mm -hmm. then we can say that we are successful. In that aspect, then it means that even when you don't have money, when you are poor, but you've achieved the mandate which God has given you, mm -hmm. then to me, you are successful. That, that is success. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Takuza, you're, 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 you're a money guy, aren't you? <laughs> how, how would you define success? Well, um, <clears throat> I don't know whether I would, I would have to define it from a purely monetary point of view because I think from, from a finance point of view, to be the simplest thing, it's just looking at the figures, who has more money and who doesn't. But um, <clears throat> looking at it from um, the biblical perspective or maybe from a, a more wholesome point of view, mm -hmm. it would include a lot of other aspects other than just money, like um, what she just said. In my opinion, there, there is a little, a little bit of whatever percentage it should be, there's a certain aspect of, of, of money that has to be looked at because I believe that for anything to happen for whether it's, it's, it's secular or spiritual, there has to be a certain amount of money that's forked out. Yeah, so <clears throat> there is that aspect. But um, whatever individuals think success is, in my opinion, it will depend on, on um, what your objective is, what, what we're talking about. Are we talking about um, results at school? Are we talking about making money in life? Are we talking about raising children? Some of the things are quantifiable, some of them are not. Okay. But <clears throat> at the end of the day, whether an individual is successful or not, we should also look at what they have achieved or where they are versus where they were 
in the beginning. Okay. I'll give you an example, I'll give a monetary example so that it's, it's easier. If, if you're a millionaire, let's say your net worth is 900 million, a lot of people, you are richer than a lot of people in my opinion, yeah, definitely. But if your parents gave you an estate that was $30 billion and right now you're worth $900 million, then you're not successful in as much as you're richer than 90% of the world. Okay. And that's because <clears throat> you have deteriorated from where you were previously. Okay. Or if at least you stay where you were, uh -huh. your parents give you uh, an inheritance worth Two million, and then after 10, 20 years, you're still there. Then that's not success in as much as you are regarded as rich. In my mind, I'm thinking of um, the, the parable of the talents. Okay. One guy had five, the other one two, the other one one. And how God judged them was not based on what they had at the end, uh -huh. but what they had in relation to what they were initially given. Uh -huh. So if I can give an example from that before I, I, I wind up what I'm saying. If I can give an example, the guy with two talents, uh -huh. at the end of the period, now he had what, four talents, yeah. which was still less than the five talents that this other guy had, Started. even if he had chosen not to invest. Uh -huh. So would that mean that God would have been happier with the five talents guy because at the end of the day he had more talents than everyone else? No. If he had chosen not to invest, God was still going to be angry with him, even though he still had more than what the two talents guy had okay. after investing. Okay. So whatever it is, I believe one of the most important concepts of success is improvement and growing. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Cheza, how do you know you're successful? <laughs> um, just to add on to the definitions that have already been beautifully put, mm -hmm. Um, success is when you start off with a seed mm -hmm. and it grows into a plant. Okay. The plant bears fruit. Mm -hmm. So success has to do with growth, progression, um, setting a, a goal okay. and achieving it. Okay. Yeah. So how, 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 do you, how do you tie that in with managing for the master? Uh, okay, you mentioned the mandate that he gave us. Uh, in Matthew 28, when he said, go out and uh, baptize, uh, you know, grow, grow this thing. And um, uh, they, they went out to do that. But is, is, is success, who defines success? Who decides whether you're successful or not? What I'm asking is, how do you measure it? Because Taku's already said that, okay, there's, there's money that we use, but it's, it's not just limited to money. So how do you measure success? Because, I, I mean, already we've already come up with money as a, as a measure. Uh, it's the easiest. It's easy, it's easy to quantify. If, if I had three bucks this morning and I have five bucks <laughs> at the end of the day, uh, it, I, can, I can say, look, I've, I've achieved some measure of success. But if we say money is not all, how else? How, how, how would God's manager um, measure success? Maybe the first principle, <clears throat> maybe something that I left out or maybe that I didn't properly say out is the fact that success itself is dependent on what the objective is. Like, if I'm going to school, then success would be passing school. If I fail, then I'm not successful. But overall, since we're talking about um, God and what he expects from us, I would go back to Matthew chapter 8, verse 36 to uh, and 37, which says, For what shall it profit a man though he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Okay. At the end of the day, whether you come out rich or poor, whether you, you, you have so many qualifications or not, at the end of the day, for me, mm -hmm. the first measure of success is making it to heaven. Okay, making it to heaven. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, I think a lot of Christians would agree. Yeah. Yes, it's making it to heaven, but heaven will be a lonely place if you are the only one there. Yeah. So it's uh, making it to heaven and also making it to heaven with others that you have also assisted in going to heaven. It's, um, it's not a, a really an issue of numbers. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm thinking of where, for instance, we know we do, we hear lots of reports. We, in our churches, we do lots of reports. And one of them, which I always... 
worry about is the number of baptisms that have been done. You know, uh -huh. if you've got a goal, you are given a goal by the conference or by the union, eh? your, your church should, by the end of the year, should have uh, baptized 300. Uh -huh. And if you have baptized 100, uh, then it's a big issue. But really, um, with those uh, 100, if they are what somebody said, good quality Christians, then you've, you've been very successful than having 300 nominal Christians. Okay. You know, um, so really the success is not just the numbers, but also is the quality of whatever thing that you have, you have, um, <laughs> you are achieving. Mm -hmm. Yes. You don't want uh, just to have numbers mm -hmm. that I baptized 300, but when Jesus comes, none of those 300 go to heaven. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then you've not done anything really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so what's coming up out here is that success is, in terms of managing for the master, is more qualitative than it is quantitative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And I think there's there's an advantage mm -hmm. in in that it's not quantitative because if we are then able to have a way to measure um, our success in terms of managing for the master, mm -hmm. sometimes we might end up um, uh, being self-centered and. Uh, boasting that this is what I have achieved. Or you can be discouraged thinking that you are not making any progress because this success that we're speaking of, it cannot, it cannot be um, quant quantified. Mm -hmm. And as a result, um, it's an advantage in that you will always be pushing yourself to do best to achieve more for Christ. And you will not be self-centered and thinking that this is my achievement. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, we're, we're, well, I've never been married, but two of us here on the panel <laughs> are at the time of recording. <laughs> um, but uh, it's, it seems when we're talking about success in, in, in terms of managing for the master, it's, uh, it's more like, it's more of a question of, it's more akin to a question of, uh, how do I have a successful marriage as opposed to how do I have a successful bank account? And it's, it's com what's coming out here is the relational aspect. And the truth is relational success is not really quantifiable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, I mean, you, you can't really come up with numbers to say this is why I have a bad relationship. But qualitatively, you can tell yeah. um, that things have gone on. Now, if, 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 if success is uh, relational, as we've as we've said, why then did God give us work? And I'm, I'm not pulling this out of thin air. We'll ask Uchieza to read for us uh, Genesis 2, verse 15. Genesis 2, verse 15. Verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Yeah, I mean, in paradise, why would there be work in paradise? I, you know, there's this um, saying that uh, an idle mind is the devil's workshop. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. So really, you know, the advantage of, um, of, of work really is, is to keep us occupied. One, that's one. Uh, it keep, keeps you away from mischief. It, it also is very good for your mental health, for your, all these good things that I can mention. I can actually have an hour-long presentation on <laughs> on that. We, we will remember that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it, it, so even in paradise where, where everything was perfect, mm -hmm. the, the Adam needed to be doing something okay. for him to, to, to be active. You see what happened when, when Eve wandered away. She was now very idle and she was doing nothing and it was easy for her now to be deceived okay. because she was, she was not occupied. Okay. And uh, she was occupied in the wrong things. So it keeps us in the straight and narrow. So it's, it's, it's important to work. And um, I, I know we are going to talk about it uh, later on, probably, about how then the work should be done. Okay. You know, you know the, the, the issue of being honest, uh -huh. integrity, and things like that, uh -huh. that also come in. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so now, now that we're talking about work, and obviously... You can't talk about success without talking about work. Yeah. 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 Um, how do you feel about the line that says you should follow, follow your passion? Because often when people talk about career guidance, the term passion comes up. Mm -hmm. How do you feel? Do you, uh, <laughs> would you quit your, 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 work, your high earning job to follow your passion? That well, doesn't... I, 
I would start with Ezekiel okay. chapter 16, verse 49. Okay. It talks about what the sin of Sodom was, and it says, amongst other things, it was abundance of bread and idleness. Okay. I don't know, maybe maybe it's my lack of Bible study, but <laughs> I'm really here to find, not that the Bible is exhaustive when it comes to career guidance, but I'm here to find a part of scripture that talks about working for the sake of pursuing fun or, or something like that. Or okay. it's the main the, the main thing is to avoid idleness, okay. in my opinion. That's the first issue about work, to avoid idleness. Because there are a lot of people who then say, I'm unemployed right now. I can't do this because I haven't gotten a job that I love and that I'm passionate about. In, in my thinking, the first objective is to avoid being idle, like I said. I don't think that work is necessarily meant to be fun. It just has to be less boring. <laughs> What's the difference? <laughs> the fun part, okay, the fun part about work is the success that you get from it. Even the words that the Bible uses to describe work out of your labor, okay. you know, it out of your labor and stuff like that. It's, 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 it's not necessarily something that has to be enjoyable because even if you pursue something that's your passion, uh -huh. if you now have to wake up every day doing it, it ceases to be fun. I mean, anything that's done every day, even if it's something that you love, becomes boring. And if you now have to, if your income is based on that, if you now have to do it for a living or else you don't get an income, then it won't be as fun as, as it is when it's a hobby. Okay. So in my opinion, first of all, you're looking for something that's going to take away idleness. Secondly, you're looking for something that's going to give you money. Uh -huh. Because based on my experience, <laughs> <laughs> even if you do something that you don't like, if it gives you proper money, you end up liking it. Okay. Come what may. And you end up being passionate about it because, I mean, the Bible says money answered it. A feast is made for laughter and wine maketh many. But my, wine make, make it merry. But... Money answered all things. You can go for holidays. You can do whatever you like and cancel out all the stress that you're having at work and, and stuff like that. So, I mean, but would you throw passion out completely? I do think yeah. passion has a, an important place when it comes to work because ultimately when we're working, in order to be successful, you have to reach a certain goal. And our main goal as Christians is to make a difference, to touch lives, to have an impact um, in people's lives for Christ. Okay. So for example, as a doctor, you don't want to be a doctor who just makes the money, but you have to be a doctor who makes a difference in the person's life. Uh, we know that we've been to hospital, a doctor who speaks to you with love and kindness is different from a doctor who speaks to you um, with a straight face and just gets, he can get the job done by giving you the correct medication. But a doctor who speaks to you with love, uh -huh. there's a certain impact that they will leave with you. So I think passion has a place. Okay. And I also think passion is also tied somehow with, with talent and Christ calls us to be good stewards of our, Tats. of our talents. So I think passion and talent they go together somehow, so they are, and it's important that you have, you, you shouldn't put that excuse as to say that you, you say, I'm not going to work um, because I haven't found my passion, but I think passion is then what drives you to be an effective worker. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. There's also the issue that, um, you know, when you are getting a job, uh -huh. don't just get the job because you want the money. Uh -huh. Of course, that's the ultimate reason why one goes, yeah. gets a job, is yeah. to get some money. But if, because what I'm saying is there are some jobs where you realize that they, you may need to compromise your beliefs, for instance. Mm -hmm. But they're offering you good money, mm. you know. And then, because we are saying that there's nothing about passion, so uh, I want to make money. So you compromise so that you make the money. But really, um, I know of people. Um, not me, but others. <laughs> we have, um, because I, I, I'm fine where I am. Yeah. But uh, there are people, there are, I know of people who have um, left high paying jobs because they did not enjoy it. You know, maybe the boss is not, is not nice, or there's something that is happening in the organization uh -huh. which really compromises them 
as maybe as Christians, let me not just say Adventists, but as a Christian, you are seeing things that are happening and they are, they are, they are, they are contrary to your beliefs and your values. Okay. And, the, and those people have left those kind of jobs and done uh, maybe less paying jobs, which they really enjoy. Okay. Um, not necessarily being employed, but even self-employed. Like we were talking about someone doing catering, for instance, or baking, or doing some other work, which they really enjoy. They, would, they won't mind waking up at 4 a.m. or even spending the whole night chopping uh, cabbages and things like that. Because they, that is their passion. That is, they find the word that you used, meaning in that. So it is really important that uh, whatever work that you find to do, whether it's a formal job or an informal job that you are doing, that you do it, one, it does not compromise your values, uh, but it also gives you an income. It doesn't have to be a, a, yeah. a mountain of money, but okay. enough for you to survive. Okay. But, but, but look, yeah. it's sounding like a first world concept to me, the way that they're saying it out. I, I do agree with what they're saying, but... I mean, let's look at the African context. Let's be real. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> look, you've got, uh, in the African setup, you've got 10, 15 nieces in the village okay. who need to be taken care of. You've got um, a, a parent who's now about to retire. You've got siblings and stuff like that. That's the case with most individuals. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, choosing passion would be, it's okay, but... I don't think it comes first, but, it, but what they're saying is very <laughs> right. But well, maybe circumstances will differ depending on what, okay. what, what's the most pressing issue. For, okay. for most individuals in less developed countries, the, the most pressing issue is to get an income that covers all the basic needs. Okay. You won't talk of success no matter how much you love the job when your kids are... Yeah, so maybe maybe out maybe at the end of the day it will depend on what the most pressing issue is. If all of your basic needs are kind of covered in a way, then maybe you'd prioritize your passion. So perhaps what we're trying to say is that uh, as important as, as passion is, uh, whether you're doing something you're passionate about or not, as the memory text was saying, diligence is necessary. Mm -hmm. in, in other words, uh, look for meaning. Mm -hmm. Because the human is a, is a creature of meaning. Um, mm -hmm. Have we seen, can we come up with of examples of what happens in a society when people have nothing to do? Uh, I think we, we, I'm sure all of us remember what happened. Uh, we all know when people had nothing to do. Well, most people, I had something to do. During the, during the lockdown period, yeah, a lot of you guys who were called uh, non-essential, had no jobs. They really had nothing to do and were staying at home. Um, now that we are evaluating the effects of the lockdowns, we're seeing that there are a lot of mental health issues uh -huh. that have come up because people really were idle most of the time. Those who were idle have got, all, because of loneliness and, uh, and other things, a lot of people went into drugs, especially the youth. We've got, um, in our country here, we are seeing that a lot of people also had, uh, you know, uh, teenage pregnancies went up. Uh -huh. And you know what comes with teenage pregnancies? There's HIV infection, there's STIs and things like that. So really, if you are idle, then the devil definitely will work on you. But there were people who took advantage of that lockdown period to do things uh, which were contrary or which were different from what they were doing, like their jobs, which maybe they did not enjoy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and went and took that opportunity to follow their passions. Uh -huh. And uh, up to now, some of them are actually doing that. I know of others who started maybe farming, uh, you know, going into full farming full time because during that time, and they realized um, great profits and also contentment more than they did when they were at work. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Well, so much for that. Now we want to look at uh, working to build the home, working to build a family. Um, Chesa, please read for us 1 Timothy 5 verse 8. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Yo. <laughs> That's quite strong. Yeah. It's quite strong to, to think, well, if, if you think you're a church guy and you're not looking after your family, uh, then you might, you're, you're, you're actually worse off than somebody who doesn't believe yeah. at all. I mean, wh what does that say? Um, 
about family, the importance of family in, in terms of being a successful person? I think the first thing that's coming out there is that no matter how successful you may be in the eyes of the world, if you haven't given to your family what you're supposed to give to them, uh -huh. whether, it's in term, whether it's financial or even your time to them or stuff like that, then the Bible is regarding you as worse than a, a believer, especially monetary-wise, because that, that's what it's talking about. Uh -huh. And I, I also love looking at it even from not necessarily a secular point of view, but you know, it's, it's easy for someone to give back to one person who's also given to them. Uh -huh. It's a general advice to anyone who's in their working years, especially those that are uh, parents. It's very wise to invest in your kids because at some point in time, you're going to retire. Uh -huh. And especially in, in, in African countries where pensions don't work that much way, economies are, yeah, we all know the story and you really can't make a financial investment that will benefit you after you retire. It's, it may be wise to invest in your kids because one day you, you, they'll be working at some point in time and you won't, and you won't even be having the energy to do part-time work or stuff like that, you'll be retired and all. So if you spend your years or your excess income on expensive clubs, maybe alcohol and stuff like that, and you're not investing, you're also not spending on your kids. I'm sure they'll do the same when you're also grown up. I'm not saying that, I'm not encouraging people to do that, but I'm just saying it's easier for someone to give back when they appreciate the effort that you've put in, in, in that you've put in raising them up, than when they just feel like, ah, oh, this guy just did the basics to raise up, you just pay the fees and that was all. Okay. So yeah, it's, it's just my advice to say, even over and above what the Bible says, I mean, consider that it will be easy for your kids to also give you back and to take care of, take care of you when they're now grown up, if you take care of them right now. But isn't black tax a burden that we should get rid of? I mean, well, well for, for those who may not know what I mean by black tax, I'm, I'm talking about uh, looking after members of what I guess the West would call the extended family, but in, in our context, yeah. there's just family. So, you know, somebody said, oh, what's an extended family? Do you use bricks? How do you extend your family? <laughs> 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 but uh, so, I mean, isn't black tax a burden that we should get rid of? Uh, where, where do you draw the line between looking after, uh, what I'm asking is, what really is family when we say looking after loved ones? For us, family is very big. You know, uh, people who, who come from the West are shocked to find that our, our weddings have 500 guests because there's no way you cannot invite uh, your relatives. And how do you balance that with uh, your, your responsibility to make sure that your children uh, get the best they can in life? You, you know, you said something that is important, that family, maybe it's, it's not just you, your wife, and your children. Mm -hmm. In our context, really, yeah. that's not family. Family is much bigger than that. And we look out for each other. And remember at the beginning, we talked about success being uh, making a difference okay. yes, in people's lives. And that is part of it. If you've got um, one way really is you'll be looking after your own children by supporting even those other ones who are not um, part of the nuclear family. Uh -huh. What am I saying? For instance, you've got maybe nieces or nephews uh, who are um, whose parents or their orphans or whose parents are not able to to do for them what what you are able to do for your own children? If you are going to share whatever resources you have with those with those other nieces and, and nephews, and they also get a good education and they got, get a good foundation that they can look after themselves, they will stop being a burden okay. even on your own children when they are grown up. Because if if they are if they if they do, if they are not capacitated to look after themselves, even when they are older, they will be a burden, yeah, even to your own children. So you are protecting your own children also by, by teaching others, by, by capacitating the, the extended family. Um, it, that is very important. In our culture, that is what is Ubuntu is all about. I am because you are. You know? um, that, 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 is, that is what we are. We have, of course, now, because of what is happening, uh, where people now, jobs are not, are not easy to get, you know, money is tight. We have sort of like um, 
relegated those manda that mandate that we have, that God has given us, where he says that then if we are not looking after your family, then you are worse than an unbeliever. Mm -hmm. Because being a believer means that you will take care of everybody else. Uh, and uh, what I've noticed really is that it is easier. I remember asking this question to some ladies once. Why is it that it's more difficult to assist a stranger than your own relative? Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, it's always like that. It, it's difficult to assist your own relatives. But if there's a call at church, for instance, that there's somebody who needs school fees, it's easy to, to give your money for that, school, for that child to go to school. But your own relative, it becomes a bit more difficult. But God here is mandating us to look after our own before we even go out. Okay. Let's also remember that mm. at some point you are probably also someone else's black tag. Yes. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's important to also remember that. And you cannot then look at it as a burden because whatever you do to help someone, God is not blind to it. Mm -hmm. He's placed you in that position uh, for a purpose. And so when you then take out money from your pocket to help um, your niece with school fees, surely God will not turn his back on you and um, suddenly not provide for your own children at some point. And so that's why this verse says, um, he has denied the faith. Mm -hmm. So it's also by faith that you will be doing that act. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's just said that a lot of people see it as, as a bit. Of course, in a way, it does look like a burden, but then, like what she said, at some point in time, a lot of individuals were beneficiaries of, of that text. So people see it as a burden to success, because remember the lesson is talking about planning for success, and a lot of people, when they're now ending, don't want to be burdened by that. But I, I would say that... <laughs> I think during that time when you're working, probably maybe from around 23 years to most people retire around 60, 65, mm -hmm. it's also not a time for you to increase your expenses unnecessarily. I mean, especially in the African setup where you already have extended family to take care of, it would be unwise, in my opinion, to have 12, 13 kids, some other ones planted out there and all that, and you now have to take care of them. It's, it's, it's not wise in terms of... Um, finance-wise, because <clears throat> we're saying you already have a burden that you have to take care of, and then you bring onto the table something that's going to increase to that burden. So in, in my opinion, it may be also best to limit expenses in terms of number of children, in terms of even the cars that you drive. Don't just get a Gazla, five-liter petrol car and you're using it every day to go to work. It's not necessary. I think as much as possible, limit your expenses so that you're able to um, cover all the necessary expenses that are there, mm -hmm. save and also invest for the future. Okay. Uh, just one more before we yeah. continue. Yeah, I, I'm just reminded of the memory text. Whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord. Uh -huh. So if you, <laughs> if you are going to consider that helping those people that you are helping, is you are doing it unto the Lord, is unto the Lord, uh -huh. then yeah. it's not a burden anymore. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And in the context of managing for the master, those resources mm. that you have are not yours. Yes. Uh -huh. So they are not yours to keep and uh, God is calling you. He's put you in that position so that you're able to help the next person. Okay. Yeah. So uh, what, what I'm getting is here in Africa, already from our cultural background, we already have a, an understanding yes. that success is not merely individual. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's okay. communal. Mm -hmm. in, in a, suc a successful person is one who lives in a, in a, in a, in a healthy community, yes. which yeah. is coming up with the, the communal um, outlook. But coming closer to, to home, um, perhaps to what uh, those in the West would call the nuclear family, coming close to the nuclear family, because at least that's where a lot of uh, responsibility is exercised. Mm -hmm. um, how would you advise somebody to balance the need to put food on the table? And which is what I, I wanted you to read out, um, Proverbs 14, verse 23. Proverbs 14, verse 23. Yeah. <clears throat> in no labor there is profit, but the talk of the lips tendeth only to penury. Yeah, okay, thank you. And another version I read earlier this, 
earlier said um, uh, uh, talk just puts nothing on the table. So we all have this um, responsibility to to provide for our families, to provide food. But how do you balance that with the need to spend time? Uh, because especially you mentioned lockdown, having people have to catch up after lockdown. <laughs> and people are, I, I, I was speaking to somebody earlier who said he actually works 13 hours a day, six days a week. And mm-hmm. he was complaining that it's really stressed, putting a strain on him, but he, he has no choice. He has to make an income. So how do you balance um, that sort of that sort of need to put food on the table and the need to spend time with the family. How do you work it out? Um, that that question is um, is um, is something which has been cons- which is which has been a topic that has been discussed in many <laughs> in many fora. Contentious <laughs> topic. <laughs> yes, many fora have have talked about that. You know things about quality time with your children. You know quality time with your family. Uh-huh. It's very important. Um, you just have to find a way of balancing the everything. Sometimes it's all not about money. You know, um, you know, you read stories about people, maybe somebody is married to somebody, yeah, staying in a mansion, mm-hmm. and, but you are, you are unhappy in that mansion because there's no relationship that is going on there. There is no relationship. Like the guy that you're talking about was working 13 hours a day. Um, their, their relationships at home obviously are affected. Mm-hmm. And, um, and besides his own health is also affected. Mm-hmm. To make matters worse, even in our country, for instance, we are seeing a lot of people leaving even this country to go and look for greener pastures outside the country. Mm-hmm. And uh, then these long distance relationships, how it has affected marriages, for instance. Yeah. yeah. And even uh, where parents, for instance, will go maybe to England and leave their children and they are just spoiling those kids to try and make up for their absence uh-huh. and creating terrible citizens uh, because of that. So we really need to, to ask God for guidance. Sometimes it may not be necessary to go as far as overseas to make that money. You make it where you are. Uh, let me leave it there. <laughs> I think once yeah. we understand um, the ultimate goal of success, once we understand the definition, what we call success, that it doesn't center around money or understand that I need to um, make sure I have time with my kids, I need to make sure I provide for them, I need to make that balance. And to make that balance, you also, you also need wisdom from God. Okay. Mm. okay. Thank you. Now, you, Takuza, when you're speaking, you, you brought up um, the issue of uh, kids sprinkled here and there. Yeah. Um, yeah, of course, I mean, we've talked about the good thing about an African society that we understand the need for a healthy community. Mm-hmm. But also, we have, well, I, I can't speak for other societies because I've, I've only known this African society. Um, uh, a man with more than one woman is viewed as successful. Do you agree? Yeah, well, it goes back to what we spoke about <clears throat> earlier when we began the lesson about the definitions of success. Uh-huh. And maybe one aspect that we probably kind of left out is that a lot of, for a lot of things, there is a worldly view and there is a biblical view to it. Uh-huh. So, yeah, we all know what success is, but <clears throat> how society views it may be a little bit different from how the Bible views it. So... Like what you're saying, for, for me to be promiscuous and have eight girlfriends and none of them discover and I'm regarded as the goat because uh-huh. I have all that. And it's, it's not necessarily how the Bible views it. And if I go back to the text that I read that to say, what shall it profit a man even though you may gain the whole world and lose your own soul? Uh-huh. Ultimately, that, that will not lead to success. So maybe if I can just also just... Why, why not? Why, why is it not successful to have... Uh, a whole group of women in your life. Well, in the, at the end of the day, if you're not going to go to heaven, then what's the point? Okay. <laughs> so it has no just, immediate consequences. The consequences are later. Of course, they, they're there. I mean, I, I just spoke of how it's a financial burden for you to have 30 kids when you're just earning peanuts and stuff like that. At least try to limit your expenses so that you're able to manage. That's that's the at least the world worldly side to it. And maybe just to go back to what you're talking about. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's, it's a difficult balance to, to say that 
you work long hours to make to make money that's at least enough for you to take care of your family. Where possible, you can take your family to a hustle. Take them to a side hustle. <laughs> they take part in it. They help you out. You're spending time whilst you're also accomplishing okay. the work. They'll also grow up with an appreciation of why you weren't spending as much time at home because I, I know for most families, sometimes kids are a little bit bitter and they're detached from their dads because they never spend time at home, yet they were sacrificing that time just in order to provide a loaf of bread for them. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Chiesa, what do you think? Do you think a, a man with a lot of women in his life is successful? Because, I mean, it's, I'm not pulling this out of thin air. We, we all know that here in our society, one of the signs that a guy has made it is uh, a whole litany of women around him. Yeah. Um, in my opinion, it's, uh, that's not sexist. Okay. Because as we said, how can you, how can you increase your, your, your expenses? Um, what, what goal have you set for your life? Mm -hmm. um, what um, will these plenty women help you to achieve? Okay. So for me, it's not it's not of in the bigger picture of things. It's more it doesn't benefit. Okay. Yeah. So so what you're saying is that it reveals a a, a sort of myopic, uh, narrow uh, worldview. Then the narrower you are, the harder it is to to fight the temptation. <laughs> Uh, as a man, I don't know, you have something to say? Um, you know, I don't know. When I'm thinking about planning for success and then having all these women, and how that helps. Um, you know, I'm just looking at the, at the conflict that is there between the women themselves fighting for your attention and you trying to balance things out with all these women and uh, maybe even the children. You were talking about 30. I know there's someone in Zimbabwe with 19. Sure. I don't know how he was managing it, but... Um, um, you know, it's, it, 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 it goes against the principles that God has given us. Okay. Yeah. That's one thing that we, we need to understand as Christians that it is not Christian to do that. Okay. Yeah. As long as we are going against the principles of God, then you are no longer successful in whatever you are doing. Okay. Yeah. You, you've gone far away from, from God's uh, mandate and therefore you are not, you are no longer successful. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, so now we've, we've been looking at work and home and success at home and how to work to, to build a home. But how do, you, how do you approach work outside? How, do, how, how, is a, how is a manager for God to, how is he meant to look at work in the office? Um, let's read Genesis 39, verse 2 to 5. Genesis 39, verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. Okay. Um, let's get a little background to this. Who, who is this master, Joseph? What's going on? How, how did we get here? Anyone? Okay, Joseph was an Egypt. He was not. He was not an Egyptian. Okay. He was there as a slave, uh -huh. and his master Potiphar actually bought him from, from some Ishmaelites. Ishmaelites who had bought him from his from his family. His yeah. own family had actually sold him as a slave. So here he is now. He is now a slave in Potiphar's house, and um, what is important to note is verse two, and the Lord was with Joseph. Uh -huh. That if as long as Joseph kept his relationship with God. He was a prosperous man. That's the second part of that sentence. Mm -hmm. um, Joseph did not forget where he came from, which is what most people do. He did not forget where he came from. And, um, and he was very successful and he was prosperous. And, the, and the, this prosperity that he had and the success that he had in the house of Potiphar uh, was not lost on Potiphar. He realized that now this guy is in my house and he's prosperous and because he's being blessed by God, I'm also getting the blessings. Uh -huh. Yes, and he was very happy that to such an extent that he said, you know what, Joseph, you, you just look after everything. The Bible says that uh, Potiphar, the only thing that worried him was what was on in front of him when he was having his dinner. 
Okay. That is all that he was worried. He was not worried about anything because he knew everything was working out. Because Joseph was a very honest person. Mm -hmm. He was honest, he had integrity. He, he did things as unto the Lord, okay. yes, and not unto men. And uh, which is something which we lack ourselves. Where, for instance, the, when the when the cats is 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 away, the mice will play. The mice will play. This is what happens in most work situations. When uh -huh. the boss is not there, people forget that they are there at work and they've got some some duties that they need to do. Uh -huh. But if you're a Christian, you be honest. You do your work even when no one is looking, which is what uh, integrity is, uh -huh. doing the right thing even when nobody is looking. Okay. I think for me uh -huh. what's striking is that the master saw that the Lord was with him. This is not a master that um, uh, believed in the same God that uh -huh. Joseph did, but through Joseph's work, work ethic, he saw that, no, this guy, I can prosper because his, his God is blessing him. Whatever he touches, God blesses him. So without Joseph having even to preach, because most of the time we think that being a Christian, I need to preach, I need to put it out there. Uh -huh. But no, even in our workplaces, the way we conduct ourselves, the way we do our work, uh -huh. um, is we're representing who God is. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, Because Joseph certainly had excuses to do less than his best. Yeah. I mean, for one, slavery wasn't his passion. Yeah, it was not his choice. It was, it was his passion. It wasn't yeah. Was, yeah. Yeah. And as a slave, he's at, he's at the bottom. Yeah. So he can think, well, look, so I miss one or two things. What does it matter? Yeah. 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 And he's in a foreign land and he's also in a worldly setup, if I can put it uh -huh. that way, which cancels out the excuse that we can never be integrous or work hard or be really ideal in... In a, in, in a worldly setup, I know there's a lot of individuals who think that I can only um, work for my master perfectly or for my boss perfectly if I'm working in a church setup or something like that. But that's not true. You don't have to be in that position in order for you to be to be diligent, to be hardworking, to be integrous. It's but the truth though is that it's it's, it's planning for success. It's increasingly becoming difficult. That's the honest truth uh -huh. to to really remain pure and integrous and hardworking and faithful, given how the world has become. I mean, something simple. You go to the market right now. The bag where they put the potatoes, there are potatoes on top. Underneath there are stones, and these are the mud, mud-like things. And, <laughs> and and that that's just how the world is run these days. And. It's as if all those individuals who are doing that are being successful and for you to follow the right path means that probably your stuff is not going to sell as much as the others and all that. At the end of the day, it's also depending on God because yeah, given how corrupt the world is, it's, it's really difficult, but it's possible because he was an example. Because no, I like that you brought that up. I wanted to bring up the, to, for us to discuss the, the fact that in our country, I think it's an open secret that mm. we have struggles with corruption. Yeah. Mm. And yet, I think is it more than 80% of us on every weekend find our way to a church. How do you feel about that dichotomy? What, what's it saying about us, is it? What's missing in our religion that makes us not as, in, uh, as integrous as Joseph? Because Joseph's integrity actually sent him to jail. It's because we separate religion from, it's as if religion is an event that we okay. participate in over the weekend, whether it's Saturday or Sunday. Then on Monday when we go about our business, we, we, we handle our finances and our business the way that we want, which is why I think this lesson is timely because it's coming with <clears throat> a, a secular concept or rather a worldly concept planning for success and it's putting it within the limits of, of Christianity to say that this is not just something that we talk of outside the circles of Christianity. Mm -hmm. It's actually something that you have to do as a religious obligation or rather as, as part of your Christian life. Mm -hmm. So it's the idea that church and my Christian life remains at church and I won't take it into my business. That's what makes the, the, the situation to be like that. 
but true Christianity, though, is seen in our, how we conduct ourselves on a daily basis and how we do our business. Okay. Uh, Christianity or our religion really should be us, what we are, should define who we are. You know, I'm thinking of the Israelites when they were in the, even when they, when they were in the, um, on their journey in the Exodus, or even when they, when they reached Canaan, the temple was right at the center, and they were, they were, they were circled around the temple, uh -huh. around, uh, uh, around the temple. So God was there. Uh -huh. The Holy of Holies was there in the center. So if God is at the center of our lives, then we will not separate our religion from our other lives. Mm -hmm. Because our religion will be our life. If I'm, I'm selling at the market, giving his example, um, and I'm selling potatoes, I will not put uh, bricks underneath or rocks underneath to, to, to sort of like sell less you. potatoes mm -hmm. for the same price. I will be honest and you know, and we'll see what God will do. He will, I, will, I will prosper even when I'm doing that, more than even those who have been corrupt. I think we've told ourselves that God helps those who help themselves. Who help themselves. I uh -huh. think that is the the message that is floating around everywhere. Uh -huh. And we're thinking by doing that, we're actually helping ourselves when, when in fact, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. What do you think, Chieta? Don't you think Takuts and uh, Norms are being too spiritual? Because, <laughs> I mean, life is hard. You have to survive. <laughs> no, I agree with them totally okay. because um, we, we cannot step out of our Christian shoes uh -huh. after Sabbath. Uh -huh. Whatever we do, we have to do it to the glory of God. Mm -hmm. And he's going to bless whatever it is that you touch. He will, multi he will multiply. Just like with Joseph, he showed up um, when Joseph had integrity. And most of the times we feel like I'm not getting paid enough at this job, so my child needs um, a room of bond paper. Uh -huh. No one, no one cares. Mm -hmm. My boss won't notice. Okay. Let me just take take it. And even though there's no immediate consequences in terms of your success, in terms of your character building, what that what, what is that doing to you? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, because it's it's a it's like the third temptation of Jesus in Matthew four, where the devil took him up to a mountain top and showed him all the kingdoms and said, I'll give you all of this if you just bow down. And Jesus gave an answer which is essentially similar to the answer that uh, Joseph gave Mrs. Potiphar when uh, she tried to sexually harass him at work. Uh, and his answer was, how can I do this terrible thing before God? He didn't say, how can I violate uh, the sanctity of marriage? How can I threaten our lives when Potiphar finds out, he went straight to God. So Joseph was able to, he, be, he became so valuable to his employer because he had an abiding, he had a, a constant sense of God's uh, abiding pres presence, which I think is what would be missing here in our country in the fact that, and we can't run away from it as uncomfortable as it is, the fact that we, we have so many struggles with corruption and yet, over the weekend, so many of us uh, fill up churches. That means something's, something's off, something's not right. And from what we've said, that uh, this is the, we're managing for, for the master. We're, we're working in partnership with God. And that calls us to uh, live every day with uh, um, uh, integrity, which is missing. In a, in, a, in a, not just in our society, but in, in other societies elsewhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, now, obviously, this thing about success, um, especially when we look at managing money, I can't, I mean, I don't think anybody does it on their own. Nobody knows everything about money. At some point, you, you have to ask for help. Now, all along, you three have been telling me and, and the viewers that we have to uh, work with God. Um, but I, I don't know if it's true in your experience, but in my experience, God doesn't tell me which stock options to pick and what retirement plan to go with. I usually have to ask somebody flesh and blood. Um, and yet the Bible says we should uh, trust God. Could you read Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 8? Proverbs 3, verse 5. 
Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Okay, thank you. Um, so quickly, because our time is running out. Um, how do I go about getting advice? Yeah. Stephen is good. <laughs> He's the money guy. Yeah, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with consulting um, elsewhere. Like, like, like you say, go on, come down and tell you uh, which stock to invest in and, and things like that. Um, it's not necessarily true that all advice is to come from someone that you met at church. But one thing that I just want to mention is that in most cases, that advice is not considerate of certain uh, doctrinal principles that you uh, subscribe to. Uh -huh. So because of that, you, you need to be careful. You need to know what to take out. And someone might tell you to invest in a strip club. I mean, that's what, that's what might be making money at that time. But you, your options are not open to that. So you just have to take that out. So you just need to be careful in that way. But at the end of the day, I mean, there are several financial models and economic projections that are made. And in as much as they do have a certain level of degree of correctness, they fail sometimes. And it's when really you have to trust in God because things may turn out different from how the market had indicated, okay. which is why I think it's really necessary to, to trust in God. And also looking at the fact that from an overall point of view, the world is generally coming to an end. That's the honest truth. Okay. So yes, we have to invest in um, worldly success, which is very, very necessary. Uh -huh. But at the end of the day, the ultimate goal is to invest in the treasures of heaven. I think we spoke about that a few a few weeks ago in Lesson 6. And uh, because you look at the Bible, it already told us that things are going to continue worsening from now on until the second coming of Christ. So wherever upward trend we may see in economics, it's only just a short spike in a general downward trend. Uh -huh. Things will not continue to improve. And even if you do manage to secure success for your whole life. At the end of the day, you're going to die. And you're going to leave that behind and you still have to. You need to have a guarantee that you have treasures in heaven. Okay. Yeah. So, so in, in conclusion, um, you get, the, get as, as much good advice as you can, but just make sure it measures up with yeah. uh, uh, just God's plan and it to, his direction. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I won't ask you. Uh, what, what your view of success is, um, uh, who was more successful between Joseph and John, but we'll ask uh, Takuza <laughs> to give us a closing prayer. All right, shall we pray? To our Father in heaven, we thank you for the time that we had to study. I pray that you give us the wisdom as we plan for our future success. I pray, gracious Father, that above all, we may seek to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We may seek to lay up treasures in heaven. And um, also may also be successful here on earth. I pray, gracious Father, that we may not compare ourselves to others, but we may seek to accomplish the purpose for which you have created us. I pray this in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.